Hello. So, we've seen now the first fundamental theorem of calculus, that one that told us antiderivatives can be used to interpret the definite integral when the upper bound is a variable. So, we're now going to jump into the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So, we're going to start off by basically just immediately stating it since we have all the machinery we need and then sort of translating what it means. So, second fundamental theorem of calculus. So, as sort of usual, let now capital F be a function from R to R, so a real value function, and assume that it's some antiderivative of some function F. So, meaning that if you take the derivative of capital F, you get little f. Also, fix two values a and b with a less than b. Then, second fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that if you want to integrate to find the definite integral of little f of x from a to b, that's the same as taking capital F of b minus capital F of a. So, what this is really saying then is in the first fundamental theorem, we needed one of the uh, sort of parts, right, one of the bounds, the upper bound, to be a variable. Here, we don't have that. We just have that they are straight up values, right? So this is a normal, like, evaluate from 3 to 17 kind of situation. And this is saying if you want to find, then, the value of a definite integral, even sort of the classic ones we've been looking at, 3 to 17, you can do so by finding any antiderivative at all of that integrand, of that function inside, and then evaluating that antiderivative at both bounds and subtract the uh, lower bound from the upper bound, right? So basically, you don't have to do any of the, again, you don't need any of the sigma notation. You don't need any of the infinite rectangle craziness. You can do this just by using antiderivatives. And so this gives us another sort of nail in the coffin, as it were, for the Riemann approximation process. Really what this is telling us is that we can always do definite integrals by using antiderivatives rather than using sigma notation, even if we're using nice constant bounds as opposed to some variable. Okay, And that really is all of the second fundamental theorem of calculus. It really is that easy. All right, so what do we do? Well, from the first fundamental theorem of calculus, we established that there was a link between indefinite and definite integrals in the case where we had sort of actual functions from the outside, like if we were using a bound that was a variable. But with the second fundamental theorem of calculus, we have that, that relationship exists even with constant bounds. So sort of regardless of whether we're using a variable or not, we can still use the antiderivatives in order to calculate the uh, definite integral. And finally, the second fundamental theorem of calculus gives us this sort of key way of actually calculating in practice definite integrals. So we don't need any of the sort of complicated infinite sums and the sort of Riemann approximation with the rectangles, with the widths going to zero. We don't need any of that stuff anymore in most cases, right? Again, there are some situations where you maybe can't actually get an antiderivative, in which case you can still use a Riemann approximation to get sort of an estimate that way, and this is how a lot of computers will do it um, for stuff that doesn't have nice, clean antiderivatives. But for the most part, for most of the stuff that we need in practice, you can use this second fundamental theorem of calculus to calculate these things much faster and much easier. Okay? So that is that.